To understand the trial of Socrates in 399 BC, we need to grasp something of the volatile atmosphere in Athens at the time. The people had endured almost 100 years of warfare. First Persian invasion of Greece, defeat of Persians in Battle of Marathon, 490 BC. Second Persian invasion of Greece, Xerxes defeats the Spartan king Leonidas at the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC and burns Athens to the ground. The Greek alliance recovers and defeats the Persians. Rise of Athens as a regional power, Sparta threatened. Resulting Peloponnesian War ends in defeat of Athens and Spartan supremacy, 404 BC. Sparta installs so-called 30 tyrants in Athens. The 30 aim to destroy Athenian democracy and rule through violence, cruelty and corruption. Up to 5% of Athenian population murdered. 403 BC, the 30 are overthrown. Restoration of Athenian democracy with tacit Spartan approval. One condition. Full amnesty must be granted to all those who supported or aided the Tyrannical Thirty. By the time of Socrates' trial, the Athenian experiment in democracy rested on a knife edge. The authorities were nervous. Prior to the martial imposition of tyrannical oligarchy a few years before, the Athenian elite had already in 411 BC faced down an attempted anti-democratic coup from within their own citizenry. Democracy, a system which by definition transferred power from the aristocratic elite to the ordinary people, evidently had enemies both amongst its own elite aristocratic population, as well as the most powerful city-state in the ancient Greek world, Sparta. The aristocratic faction of course wanted power for themselves, a fact well known to the supporters of the democratic regime, many had collaborated with the Thirty Tyrants. And so, seeking self-preservation and revenge, the authorities were glad of any pretext to prosecute its enemies for crimes not covered by the amnesty. And Socrates was a target. It has always been assumed that the official charges of impiety and corrupting the youth were a smokescreen to prosecute Socrates for his anti-democratic sympathies, despite the amnesty. It may have been so. Many of his former pupils belonged to the aristocratic faction. Even the leader of the Thirty Tyrants, Critias, was once a pupil of Socrates. And it is true, Socrates himself was no democrat. Throughout his life he had taught the primacy of philosophy and knowledge. Only those who had dedicated themselves to the study of truth should ever hope to gain political power, or indeed enter heaven. Democracy, then, which entrusted power to the common man, was inherently corrupt. As a consequence, Socrates had spent his entire life undermining those among the democratic elite he felt ignorant or incapable, which was almost everybody. Socrates, in short, had made many enemies. And what of his official charges of impiety and corrupting the young? Of course, he taught what he believed to those who would listen, those with the time and means to hear him speak, which in 5th century BC Athens meant the young and wealthy and this had made him infamous amongst the Athenian population. He had been satirised in several plays of the time. His dialectic method, now recognised as a cornerstone of Western intellectual thought for the past two millennia, was ridiculed as a meaningless oratorical trick, nothing more than a means for the young to escape responsibility or dangerously worship the wrong gods. A cheap rhetoric, to use against those in authority, corrupting the young, a method to argue that up is down, right is wrong. Tellingly, the young, 
He would grow their hair long, mimicking the hated anti-democratic Spartans, or accused of Socratizing. Clearly this instability, this questioning of authority, was anathema to the precarious democracy. And equally dangerous was his religious unorthodoxy. As every Athenian knew, worship of the officially sanctioned gods, observance at feast days and state festivals, was necessary not only to ensure the virtue of one's own soul, but crucially, that true of the city-state. The Greek gods were pernicious, selfish and volatile, and could easily strike down an entire city as they could any individual man, woman or child. Proper observance was paramount. Socrates then, a man who told the court in his defence that a godly daemon spoke to him and told him what to do. A man who insisted that it was God's will that he proved the intellectual incompetence of his democratic betters was a danger not only to his own soul, but to the spiritual and physical health of the state itself. And so, before the assembled jury of 501 men, with his day-long trial over, he was found guilty and sentenced to death. Whether true or not, his prosecutors had shown him to figurehead the pernicious anti-democratic faction. His philosophy thus represented a challenge to authority, an infection for the young, his strange conception of religious worship, a danger to Athens itself. In accordance with Athenian law, he was provided an opportunity to suggest a lighter sentence. It would then be up to the jury to decide between the two. But Socrates, defiant and insisting upon his own innocence, suggested a menial fee. Enraged, the jury duly convicted him with a higher majority than before. The Socrates drank the hemlock and died. <laughs>